Bill the Bloodhound by P. G. Woodhouse. There's a divinity that shapes our ends. Consider the case of Henry Pyfield Rice, detective. I must explain Henry early to avoid disappointment. If I simply said he was a detective and let it go at that, I should be obtaining the reader's interest under false pretenses. He was really only a sort of detective, a species of sleuth. At Stafford's International Investigation Bureau, in the Strand, where he was employed, they did not require him to solve mysteries which had baffled the police. He had never measured a footprint in his life, and what he did not know about bloodstains would have filled a library. The sort of job they gave Henry was to stand outside a restaurant in the rain and note what time someone inside left it. In short, it is not Pyfield Rice, investigator number one, the adventure of the Maharaja's ruby, that I submit to your notice, but the unsensational doings of a quite commonplace young man, variously known to his comrades at the Bureau as Fathead, that blighter what's his name, and here are you. Henry lived in a boarding house in Guildford Street. One day a new girl came to the boarding house and sat next to Henry at meals. Her name was Alice Weston. She was small and quiet and rather pretty. They got on splendidly. Their conversation at first confined to the weather and the moving pictures rapidly became more intimate. Henry was surprised to find that she was on the stage in the chorus. Previous chorus girls at the boarding house had been of a more pronounced type. Good girls, but noisy and apt to wear beauty spots. Alice Weston was different. "'I'm rehearsing at present,' she said. "'I'm going out on tour next month in The Girl from Brighton. What do you do, Mr. Rice?' Henry paused for a moment before replying. He knew how sensational he was going to be. "'I'm a detective.' Usually, when he told girls his profession, squeaks of amazed admiration greeted him. Now he was chagrined to perceive in the brown eyes that met his distinct disapproval. "'What's the matter?' he said, a little anxiously, for even at this early stage of their acquaintance he was conscious of a strong desire to win her approval. "'Don't you like detectives?' "'I don't know. Somehow I shouldn't have thought you were one.' This restored Henry's equanimity somewhat. Naturally, a detective does not want to look like a detective and give the whole thing away right at the start. I think you won't be offended. Go on. I've always looked on it as a rather a sneaky job. Sneaky, moaned Henry. Well, creeping about, spying on people. Henry was appalled. She had defined his own trade to a nicety. There might be detectives whose work was above this reproach. But he was a confirmed creeper, and he knew it. It wasn't his fault. The boss told him to creep, and he crept. If he declined to creep, he would be sacked instanter. It was hard, and yet he felt the sting of her words, and in his bosom the first seeds of dissatisfaction with his occupation took root. You might have thought that this frankness on the girl's part would have kept Henry from falling in love with her. Certainly the dignified thing would have been to change his seat at table and take his meals next to someone who appreciated the romance of detective work a little more. But no, he remained where he was, and presently Cupid, who never shoots with a surer aim than through the steam of boarding-house hash, sniped him where he sat. He proposed to Alice Weston. She refused him. "'It's not because I'm not fond of you. I think you're the nicest man I ever met.' A good deal of assiduous attention had enabled Henry to win this place in her affections. He had worked patiently and well before actually putting his fortune to the test. I'd marry you tomorrow if things were different. But I'm on the stage, and I mean to stick there. Most of the girls want to get off it, but not me.' And one thing I'll never do is marry someone who isn't in the profession. My sister Genevieve did, and look what happened to her. She married a commercial traveler. And take it from me, he traveled. 
She never saw him for more than five minutes in the year, except when he was selling gent's hosiery in the same town where she was doing her refined specialty. And then he'd just wave his hand and whiz by and start traveling again. My husband has got to be close by where I can see him. I'm sorry, Henry, but I know I'm right. It seemed final, but Henry did not wholly despair. He was a resolute young man. You have to be to wait outside restaurants in the rain for any length of time. He had an inspiration. He sought out a dramatic agent. I want to go on the stage in musical comedy. Let's see you dance. I can't dance. Sing? said the agent. Stop singing, added the agent hastily. You go away and have a nice cup of hot tea, said the agent soothingly, and you'll be as right as anything in the morning. Henry went away. A few days later, at the bureau, his fellow detective Simmons hailed him. Here, you! The boss wants you. Buck up! Mr. Stafford was talking into the telephone. He replaced the receiver as Henry entered. Oh, Rice, here's a woman wants her husband shadowed while he's on the road. He's an actor. I'm sending you. Go to this address and get photographs in all particulars. You'll have to catch the 11 o'clock train on Friday. Yes, sir. He's in The Girl from Brighton Company. They open at Bristol. It sometimes seemed to Henry as if fate did it on purpose. If the commission had had to do with any other company, it would have been well enough, for, professionally speaking, it was the most important with which he had ever been entrusted. If he had never met Alice Weston and heard her views upon detective work, he would have been pleased and flattered. Things being as they were, it was Henry's considered opinion that fate had slipped one over on him. In the first place, what torture to be always near her, unable to reveal himself, to watch her while she disported herself in the company of other men. He would be disguised, and she would not recognize him, but he would recognize her, and his sufferings would be dreadful. In the second place, to have to do his creeping around and spying, practically in her presence. Still, business was business. At five minutes to eleven, on the morning named he was at the station, a false beard and spectacles shielding his identity from this public eye. If you had asked him, he would have said he was a Scots businessman. As a matter of fact, he looked far more like a motor car coming through a haystack. The platform was crowded. Friends of the company had come to see the company off. Henry looked on discreetly from behind a stout porter, whose bulk formed a capital screen. In spite of himself, he was impressed. The stage at close quarters always thrilled him. He recognized celebrities. The fat man in the brown suit was Walter Jellyf, the comedian and star of the company. He stared keenly at him through the spectacles. Others of the famous were scattered about. He saw Alice. She was talking to a man with a face like a hatchet, and smiling, too, as if she enjoyed it. Behind the matted foliage which he had inflicted on his face, Henry's teeth came together with a snap. In the weeks that followed, as he dogged the girl from Brighton Company from town to town, it would be difficult to say whether Henry was happy or unhappy. On the one hand, to realize that Alice was so near and yet so inaccessible was a constant source of misery. Yet, on the other, he could not but admit that he was having the very dickens of a time loafing around the country like this. He was made for this sort of life, he considered. Fate had placed him in a London office, but what he really enjoyed was this unfettered travel. Some gypsy strain in him rendered even the obvious discomforts of theatrical touring agreeable. He liked catching trains. He liked invading strange hotels. Above all, he reveled in the artistic pleasure of watching unsuspecting fellow men as if they were so many ants. That was really the best part of the whole thing. It was all very well for Alice to talk about creeping and spying, but if he considered it without bias, there was nothing degrading about it at all. It was an art. It took brains and a genius for disguise to make a man a successful creeper and spire. You couldn't simply say to yourself, 
I will creep. If you attempted to do it in your own person, you would be detected instantly. You had to be an adept at masking your personality. You had to be one man at Bristol, and another quite different man at Hull, especially if, like Henry, you were of a gregarious disposition and liked the society of actors. The stage had always fascinated Henry. To meet even minor members of the profession off the boards gave him a thrill. There was a resting juvenile of fit-up caliber at his boarding house who could always get a shilling out of him simply by talking about how he had jumped in and saved the show at the hamlets which he had visited in the course of his wanderings. And on this Girl from Brighton tour he was in constant touch with men who really amounted to something. Walter Jaliffe had been a celebrity when Henry was going to school, and Sidney Crane, the baritone, and others of the lengthy cast were all players not unknown in London. Henry courted them assiduously. It had not been hard to scrape acquaintance with them. The principals of the company always put up at the best hotel, and his expenses being paid by his employer, so did Henry. It was the easiest thing possible to bridge with a well-timed whiskey and soda the gulf between non-acquaintance and warm friendship. Walter Jaliffe, in particular, was peculiarly accessible. Every time Henry accosted him, as a different individual, of course, and renewed in a fresh disguise the friendship which he had enjoyed at the last town, Walter Jaliffe met him more than halfway. It was in the sixth week of the tour that the comedian, promoting him from a mere casual acquaintanceship, invited him to come up to his room and smoke a cigar. Henry was pleased and flattered. Jaliffe was a personage, always surrounded by admirers, and the compliment was consequently of a high order. He lit his cigar among his friends at the Green Room Club. It was unanimously held that Walter Jaliffe's cigars brought him within the scope of the law forbidding the carrying of concealed weapons. But Henry would have smoked the gift of such a man if it had been a cabbage leaf. He puffed away contentedly. He was made up as an old Indian colonel that week, and he complimented his host on the aroma with a fine old-world courtesy. Walter Jaliffe seemed gratified. "'Quite comfortable?' he asked. "'Quite, I thank you,' said Henry, fondling his silver moustache. "'That's right. And now tell me, old man, which of us is it you're trailing?' Henry nearly swallowed his cigar. "'What do you mean?' "'Oh, come,' protested Jaliff. "'There is no need to keep it up with me. I know you're a detective. The question is, who's the man you're after? That's what we've all been wondering all this time.' All? They had all been wondering? It was worse than Henry could have imagined. Till now he had pictured his position with regard to the girl from Brighton Company, rather as that of some scientist who, seeing but unseen, keeps a watchful eye on the denizens of a drop of water under his microscope. And they had all detected him, every one of them. It was a stunning blow. If there was one thing on which Henry prided himself, it was the impenetrability of his disguises. He might be slow, he might be on the stupid side, but he could disguise himself. He had a variety of disguises, each designed to befog the public more hopelessly than the last. Going down the street, you would meet a typical commercial traveler, dapper and alert. Anon, you encountered a heavily bearded Australian. Later, maybe, it was a courteous old retired colonel who stopped you and inquired the way to Trafalgar Square. Still later, a rather flashy individual of the sporting type asked you for a match for his cigar. Would you have suspected for one instant that each of these widely differing personalities was in reality one man? Certainly you would. Henry did not know it. But he had achieved, in the eyes of the small servant who answered the front doorbell at his boarding house, a well established reputation as a humorist of the more practical kind. It was his habit to try his disguises on her. He would ring the bell, inquire for the landlady, 
and when Bella had gone, leap up the stairs to his room. Here he would remove the disguise, resume his normal appearance, and come downstairs again, humming a careless air. Bella, meanwhile, in the kitchen, would be confiding to her ally, the cook, that Mr. Rice had just come in, looking sort of funny again. He sat and gaped at Walter Jaleef. The comedian regarded him curiously. "'You look at least a hundred years old,' he said. "'What are you made up as, a piece of gorgonzola?' Henry glanced at the mirror. Yes, he did look rather old. He must have overdone some of the lines in his forehead. He looked something between a youngish centenarian and a nonagenarian who had seen a good deal of trouble. "'If you knew how you were demoralizing the company,' Jaleef went on, "'you would drop it. "'As steady and quiet a lot of boys as ever you met till you come along, "'now they do nothing but bet on what disguise you're going to choose for the next town. "'I don't see why you need to change so often. "'You were all right as the Scotsman at Bristol. "'We were all saying how nice you looked. "'You should have stuck to that. "'But what do you do at Hull?' but roll in in a scrubby mustache and a tweed suit looking rotten. However, all that is beside the point. It's a free country. If you like to spoil your beauty, I suppose, there's no law against it. What I want to know is who's the man. Whose track are you sniffing on, Bill? You'll pardon my calling you Bill. You're known as Bill the Bloodhound in the company. Who's the man? Never mind, said Henry. He was aware, as he had made it, that it was not a very able retort, but he was feeling too limp for satisfactory repartee. Criticisms in the Bureau, dealing with his alleged solidity of skull, he did not resent. He attributed them to man's natural desire to chaff his fellow man. But to be unmasked by the general public in this way was another matter. It struck at the root of all things. "'But I do mind,' objected Jaleff. It's most important. A lot of money hangs on it. We've got a sweepstakes on in the company, the holder of the winning name, to take the entire receipts. Come on, who is he? Henry rose and made for the door. His feelings were too deep for words. Even a minor detective has his professional pride, and the knowledge that his espionage is being made the basis of sweepstakes by his quarry cuts this to the quick. "'Here, don't go. Where are you going?' "'Back to London,' said Henry bitterly. "'It's a lot of good my staying here now, isn't it?' "'I should say that it was, to me. Don't be in a hurry. You're thinking that, now we know all about you, your utility as a sleuth has waned to some extent. Is that it?' "'Well?' "'Well, why worry? What does it matter to you? You don't get paid by results, do you?' Your boss said, trail along. Well, do it then. I should hate to lose you. I don't suppose you know it, but you've been the best mascot this tour that I've ever come across. Right from the start, we've been playing it to enormous business. I'd rather kill a black cat than lose you. Drop the disguises and stay with us. Come behind all you want and be sociable. A detective is only human. The less of a detective, the more human he is. Henry was not much of a detective, and his human traits were consequently highly developed. From a boy, he had never been able to resist curiosity. If a crowd collected in the street, he always added himself to it, and he would have stopped to gape at a window with Watch This Window written on it, if he had been running for his life from wild bulls. He was, and always had been, intensely desirous of some day penetrating behind the scenes of a theatre. And there was another thing. At last, if he accepted this invitation, he would be able to see and speak to Alice Weston and interfere with the maneuvers of the hatchet-faced man on whom he had brooded with suspicion and jealousy since that first morning at the station. To see Alice, perhaps with eloquence, to talk her out of that ridiculous resolve of hers. "'Why, there's something in that,' he said. "'Rather. Well, that's settled. Now, touching that sweep, who is it?' "'I can't tell you that. You see, so far as that goes, 
I'm just where I was before. I can still watch. Whoever it is, I'm watching. Dash it so you can. I didn't think of that, said Jalief, who possessed a sensitive conscience. Purely between ourselves, it isn't me, is it? Henry eyed him inscrutably. He could look inscrutable at times. Ah, he said, and left quickly with the feeling that, however poorly he had shown up during the actual interview, his exit had been good. He might have been a failure in the matter of disguise, but nobody could have put more quite sinisterness into that ah. It did much to soothe him and ensure a peaceful night's rest. On the following night, for the first time in his life, Henry found himself behind the scenes of a theatre, and instantly began to experience all the complex emotions which came to the layman in that situation. That is to say, he felt like a cat which had strayed into a strange, hostile backyard. He was in a new world, inhabited by weird creatures who flitted about in an eerie semi-darkness, like brightly colored animals in a cavern. The Girl from Brighton was one of those exotic productions specially designed for the tired businessman. It relied for a large measure of its success on the size and appearance of its chorus, and on their constant change of costume. Henry, as a consequence, was the center of a kaleidoscopic whirl of feminine loveliness, dressed to represent such varying flora and fauna as rabbits, Parisian students, colleens, Dutch peasants, and daffodils. Musical comedy is the Irish stew of the drama. Anything may be put into it, with the certainty that it will improve the general effect. He scanned the throng for a sight of Alice. Often as he had seen the piece in the course of its six weeks wandering in the wilderness, he had never succeeded in recognizing her from the front of the house. Quite possibly, he thought, she might be on the stage already, hidden in a rose tree or some other shrub, ready at the signal to burst forth upon the audience in short skirts, for in The Girl from Brighton almost anything could turn suddenly into a chorus girl. Then he saw her among the daffodils. She was not a particularly convincing daffodil, but she looked good to Henry. With wobbling knees, he butted his way through the crowd and seized her hand enthusiastically. Why, Henry, where did you come from? I am glad to see you. How did you get here? I am glad to see you. At this point, the stage manager, bellowing from the prompt box, urged Henry to desist. It is one of the mysteries of behind-the-scenes acoustics that a whisper from any minor member of the company can be heard all over the house, while the stage manager can burst himself without annoying the audience. Henry, awed by authority, relapsed into silence. From the unseen stage came the sound of someone singing a song about the moon. June was also mentioned. He recognized the song as one that had always bored him. He disliked the woman who was singing it, a Miss Clarice Weaver, who played the heroine of the piece to Sidney Crane's hero. In his opinion, he was not alone. Miss Weaver was not popular in the company. She had secured the role rather as a testimony of personal esteem from the management than because of any innate ability. She sang badly, acted indifferently, and was uncertain what to do with her hands. All these things might have been forgiven her, but she supplemented them by the crime known in stage circles as throwing her weight about. That is to say, she was hard to please, and when not pleased, apt to say so in no uncertain voice. To his personal friends, Walter Jalief had frequently confided that, though not a rich man, he was in the market with a substantial reward for anyone who was man enough to drop a ton of iron on Miss Weaver. Tonight the song annoyed Henry more than usual, for he knew that very soon the daffodils were due on the stage to cinch the verisimilitude of the scene by dancing the tango with the rabbits. He endeavored to make the most of the time at his disposal. "'I am glad to see you,' he said. "'Shh!' said the stage manager. Henry was discouraged. Romeo could not have made love under these conditions." And then, just when he was pulling himself together to begin again, 
she was torn from him by the exigencies of the play. He wandered moodily off into the dusty semi-darkness. He avoided the prompt box, once he could have caught a glimpse of her, being loath to meet the stage manager just at present. Walter Jaleef came up to him as he sat on a box and brooded on life. "'A little less of the double forte, old man,' he said. "'Miss Weaver has been kicking about the noise on the side. "'She wanted you thrown out, but I said you were my mascot, "'and I would die sooner than part with you. "'But I should go easy on the chest notes, I think, all the same.' "'Henry nodded moodily. He was depressed. "'He had the feeling which comes so easily to the intruder behind the scenes "'that nobody loved him. The piece proceeded. From the front of the house, roars of laughter indicated the presence on the stage of Walter Jaleef, while now and then a lethargic silence suggested that Miss Clarice Weaver was in action. From time to time the empty space about him filled with girls dressed in accordance with the exuberant fancy of the producer of the piece. When this happened, Henry would leap from his seat and endeavor to locate Alice, but always... Just as he thought he had done so, the hidden orchestra would burst into melody and the chorus would be called to the front. It was not till late in the second act that he found an opportunity for further speech. The plot of the girl from Brighton had by then reached a critical stage. The situation was as follows. The hero, having been disinherited by his wealthy and titled father for falling in love with the heroine, a poor shop girl, has disguised himself by wearing a different colored necktie, and has come in pursuit of her to a well-known seaside resort, where, having disguised herself by changing her dress, she is serving as a waitress in the rotunda on the esplanade. The family butler, disguised as a bath chairman, has followed the hero, and the wealthy entitled father, disguised as an Italian opera singer, has come to the place for a reason which, though extremely sound, for the moment eludes the memory. Anyhow, he is there, and they all meet on the esplanade. Each recognizes the other, but thinks he himself is unrecognized. Exit all, hurriedly, leaving the heroine alone on the stage. It is a crisis in the heroine's life. She meets it bravely. She sings a song entitled, My Honolulu Queen, with chorus of Japanese girls and Bulgarian officers. Alice was one of the Japanese girls. She was standing a little apart from the other Japanese girls. Henry was on her with a bound. Now was his time. He felt keyed up, full of persuasive words. In the interval which had elapsed since their last conversation, yeasty emotions had been playing the dickens with his self-control. It is practically impossible for a novice, suddenly introduced behind the scenes of a musical comedy, not to fall in love with somebody. And if he is already in love, his fervor is increased to a dangerous point. Henry felt that it was now or never. He forgot that it was perfectly possible, indeed the reasonable course, to wait till the performance was over and renew his appeal to Alice to marry him on the way back to her hotel. He had the feeling that he had got just about a quarter of a minute. Quick action! That was Henry's slogan. He seized her hand. Alice! Shh! hissed the stage manager. Listen, I love you. I'm crazy about you. What does it matter whether I'm on the stage or not? I love you. Stop that row there! Won't you marry me? She looked at him. It seemed to him that she hesitated. "'Cut it out!' bellowed the stage manager, and Henry cut it out. And at this moment, when his whole fate hung in the balance, there came from the stage that devastating high note, which is the sign that the solo is over and that the chorus are now about to mobilize. As if drawn by some magnetic power, she suddenly receded from him and went to the stage." A man in Henry's position and frame of mind is not responsible for his actions. He saw nothing but her. He was blind to the fact that important maneuvers were in progress. All he understood was that she was going from him, and that he must stop her and get this thing settled. He clutched at her. 
She was out of range, and getting farther away every instant. He sprang forward. The advice that should be given to every young man starting life is, if you happen to be behind the scenes at a theater, never spring forward. The whole architecture of the place is designed to undo those who so spring. Hours before, the stage carpenters have laid their traps, and in this semi-darkness you cannot but fall into them. The trap into which Henry fell was a raised board. It was not a very highly raised board. It was not so deep as well, nor so wide as a church door. But twas enough. It served. Stubbing it squarely with his toe, Henry shot forward, all arms and legs. It is the instinct of man in such a situation to grab at the nearest support. Henry grabbed at the Hotel Superba, the pride of the esplanade. It was a thin wooden edifice, and it supported him for perhaps a tenth of a second. Then he staggered with it into the limelight, tripped over a Bulgarian officer who was inflating himself for a deep note, and finally fell in a complicated heap as exactly in the center of the stage as if he had been a star of years standing. It went well, there was no question of that. Previous audiences had always been rather cold towards this particular song. But this one got on its feet and yelled for more. From all over the house came rapturous demands that Henry should go back and do it again. But Henry was given no encores. He rose to his feet a little stunned and automatically began to dust his clothes. The orchestra, unnerved by his unrehearsed infusion of new business, had stopped playing. Bulgarian officers and Japanese girls alike seemed unequal to the situation. They stood about, waiting for the next thing to break loose. From somewhere far away came faintly the voice of the stage manager, inventing new words, new combinations of words, and new throat noises. And then Henry, massaging a stricken elbow, was aware of Miss Weaver at his side. Looking up, he caught Miss Weaver's eye. A familiar stage direction of melodrama reads, Exit cautious through gap in hedge. It was Henry's first appearance on any stage, but he did it like a veteran. My dear fellow, said Walter Jolliffe. The hour was midnight, and he was sitting in Henry's bedroom at the hotel. Leaving the theater, Henry had gone to bed almost instinctively. Bed seemed the only haven for him. My dear fellow, don't apologize. You've put me under lasting obligations. In the first place, with your unerring sense of the stage, you saw first the spot where the piece needed livening up. And you livened it up. That was good. But far better was it that you also sent our Miss Weaver into violent hysterics, from which she emerged to hand in her notice. She leaves us tomorrow. Henry was appalled at the extent of the disaster for which he was responsible. What will you do? Do? Why, it's what we have all been praying for. A miracle which should eject Miss Weaver. It needed a genius like you to come to bring it off. Sidney Crane's wife can play the part without rehearsal. She understudied it all last season in London. Crane has just been speaking to her on the phone, and she is catching the night express. Henry sat up in bed. What? What's the trouble now? Sidney Crane's wife? What about her? A bleakness fell upon Henry's soul. She was the woman who was employing me. Now I shall be taken off the job and have to go back to London. You don't mean that it was really Crane's wife? Jaleef was regarding him with a kind of awe. Laddie, he said in a hushed voice, you almost scare me. There seems to be no limit to your powers as a mascot. You fill the house every night. You get rid of the weaver woman, and now you tell me this. I drew Crane in the sweep, and I would have taken twopence for my chance of winning it. I shall get a telegram from my boss tomorrow recalling me. Don't go. Stick with me. Join the troop. Henry stared. What do you mean? I can't sing or act. Jaleef's voice thrilled with earnestness. My boy, 
I can go down the Strand and pick up a hundred fellows who can sing and act. I don't want them. I turn them away. But a seventh son of a seventh son like you, a human horseshoe like you, a king of mascots like you, they don't make them nowadays. They've lost the pattern. If you like to come with me, I'll give you a contract for any number of years you suggest. I need you in my business. He rose. Think it over, laddie, and let me know tomorrow. Look here upon this picture and on that. As a sleuth, you are poor. You couldn't detect a bass drum in a telephone booth. You have no future. You are merely among those present. But as a mascot, my boy, you're the only thing in sight. You can't help succeeding on the stage. You don't have to know how to act. Look at the dozens of good actors who are out of jobs. Why? Unlucky. No other reason. With your luck and a little experience, you'll be a star before you know you've begun. Think it over, and let me know in the morning. Before Henry's eyes there rose a sudden vision of Alice. Alice, no longer unattainable. Alice, walking on his arm down the aisle. Alice, mending his socks. Alice, with her heavenly hands, fingering his salary envelope. Don't go, he said, don't go. I'll let you know now. The scene is the Strand, hard by Bedford Street. The time, that restful hour of the afternoon, when they of the gnarled faces and the bright clothing gather together in groups to tell each other how good they are. Hark! A voice! Rather, Courtenage and the governor keep on trying to get me, but I turn them down every time. No, I said to Maloney only yesterday. Not for me. I am going with old Wally Jaleef, the same as usual, and there isn't the money in the mint that'll get me away. Maloney got all worked up. He—it is the voice of Pyfield Rice, actor. <laughs>